Uh, this is Rescue Me, rescuing a side broken Drupal about uh, doing Drupal site audits. Um, I hope, hopefully that's the talk you're here to see. Uh, about me, my name is Matt Corks. Uh, I work with Evolving Web in Montreal. I've been using Drupal since Pluto was a planet. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is me on, uh, on, on uh, Drupal.org, IRC, Slack, and on Twitter. Uh, I uh, had to add a couple numbers after my, my name. Didn't get there quite soon enough. Uh, just very quickly about Evolving Web. We have, um, uh, we're a, a small uh, a boutique Drupal uh, development agency in Montreal, um, and these are a few of our, our happy clients. We've done a lot of, in addition to site audits, we've done a lot of migration and uh, multilingual projects uh, since we live in a bilingual city. Um, great. So. Why do we do a site audit? The, uh, when, when I'm walking into a new project that was built by somebody else, um, I need to know what state it's in. You can't go bolting something onto a site that's in an unknown state. You, you try to do that, you add something, and then something falls down somewhere else, and you've got a bigger problem. So you need to, you, your first step is to get your project to a, a known good state where you know that you can uh, reliably like promise to support it. You can you know what features you can add, uh, how expensive it will be to do those. You know if there are security issues, um, if the site's already been infiltrated or if it's likely to be infiltrated next week. Uh, you need to know the lay of the land before you start working on code that was built by someone else. Maybe it'll be great, maybe not. Uh, either way, you need to know that. Um, so here's a few uh, uh, examples of, uh, of things that I've seen. Uh, does anyone here remember Drupal Geddon back in Drupal 7 days? Anyone here have to fix one of those sites? Yeah, I see a couple hands. This is, uh, well, in the question and answer period, we'll, this might turn into a bit of a group therapy thing. That's OK. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a pain. Did anyone have to fix one of those sites that didn't have proper backups? I see one hand, two. And me, I can add myself to that. Um, inexperienced prior vendors. Uh, multiple levels of outsourcing. So like each of the agencies themselves is probably okay, but once that number gets over three, like forget it. Like the person at the end of the line, they've got no idea what the person, uh, what the actual client wanted, uh, and they're not gonna be able to, to build the site that you actually need. Uh, yeah, and the idea for, for this talk came from the fact that I was thinking about how similar it was to recover from uh, a bad previous vendor and to recover from a security infiltration. I mean, in both cases, there can just be weird things in any corner of the site, and you just need to read everything thoroughly and, uh, and check it out before you can move forward. So uh, I'll start by talking about intrusion recovery. So someone's been in your site, and you don't know what they've done. So let's find out. Oh, and who here, who here has done something like this, an audit of a site that, has, that you suspect has been infiltrated? I see a few hands, OK. Maybe a little under half. Uh, the rest of you, I hope you uh, don't get to join that club. Um, yeah. So why did somebody infiltrate your site? That's the first question. Like, uh, follow the money, as they say. So usually, not always, but usually, uh, it's about the money. They're trying to make money off of your site. So uh, there might be, uh, they might be trying to do a phishing attack and uh, get into people's email addresses and then go from there go into their bank accounts. Um, they might be trying to paste exploit code so that, uh, like cross-site scripting uh, for other sites. Um, they might just simply be trying to fill it up with spam uh, uh, for Viagra or something. Um, usually, the, uh, in my personal experience, uh, the most common type of attack uh, is that someone just wants to use your Google page rank because your site has a higher ranking than theirs, and so they want to fill it up with links to their spam site. Um, less commonly, they want to make money right off of your site. And of all the times that I've had to clean up sites, I've only once seen a site, uh, a time when somebody defaced a site just for the pleasure of defacing it. Um, and they, they changed the homepage to be their, uh, uh, yeah, to be an advertisement for uh, their uh, strange political group, which I, I won't name because it's not relevant. Um, yeah, but it's, it's usually not personal. Uh, if it is, you have a much bigger problem because you'll be targeted. Um, there, are, there are entities with uh, uh, state-level resources 
who are trying to break into Drupal sites. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've had to do audits like this. Um, and those, those are much more complex. Uh, and usually they've gotten in with um, uh, phishing attacks where they've sent a fake password reset email. Um, is, so the, uh, I'm assuming most of you follow Drupal security news at least a little bit or are aware that there's regular security announcements. The, a good thing to know about those is that the vast majority um, only affect sites with untrusted users. So if your website has like five editors and you know them all, you can vouch for them, they are, they're in your office or they're, 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 they're people who are involved in your organization. Um, that's the vast majority of uh, Drupal security problems which don't apply to you. Uh, as long as they're not subject to like some sort of phishing attack and aren't clicking, these are people you can trust not to, to click on some well-crafted uh, uh, password reset email. So usually they're script kitties. And the, the, the bad thing about script kitties is that there's a lot of them. The good thing about them is that these are very low effort attacks and they're, they're, they're probably not that smart or they're not putting a lot of their effort into this. So they're, it's, uh, they're, they're relatively easy to find out. Uh, how will you know that you were attacked? Uh, I've several times I've done audits for, for someone uh, and I've realized that their site was actually compromised many months ago and they're only f realizing it now. So uh, again, these are usually script kiddies. They're usually making lots of silly mistakes and often uh, the first sign is that there's, you're going to start seeing PHP errors or uh, other warnings because uh, they're not Drupal experts and they're not, um, they don't know how to change your site uh, in a way that won't start throwing errors. So you'll see like blocks disappearing off the front page or something like that, or the, the comments won't load anymore. Um, so if, you're mon uh, you're, if you or whoever's responsible for the content on the site is, is just visiting it regularly and monitoring it, that's, the, that's usually the first way that people find out. Um, you can also use a monitoring utility. Uh, Nagios, for example, is something that will let you know if your, your server st suddenly starts using much more CPU. Um, our company had uh, a server once that was infiltrated for the purposes of mining bitcoins. So there's nothing visible on the website, but all of a sudden the CPU usage started going way up on this virtual machine because somebody was trying to mine bitcoins on our, on our web server. I don't think they got any. We, uh, we found them uh, before too long, but uh, that way you would know. Um, there's services. Uh, Pingdom is just one example. There are others. Um, that will watch your web, the a front page of your, well, any page on your site and let you know if it's changed, let you know if it's gone down, so they just try to visit it every five minutes or whatever. Um, another really useful uh, service is uh, Google Search Console. Uh, who here is using Google Search Console already for something else? Yeah, I see most, most of you are putting your hands up. Somebody in your organization should be doing that. It will let you know if there's prob problems indexing your site, uh, if there's a problem, uh, like I had it once advised me of of a problem with URLs in um, the, the sitemap.xml file. So they will proactively send out warnings um, if, the, if they notice security issues. It'll take them a couple days because they're only not indexing your site every five minutes, but they'll, they'll eventually send you a note just to be good, good uh, stewards of, their, of, their, of, uh, of the internet, I suppose, and uh, that, that can help. So you should probably be, you or somebody in your organization should be doing all these things. Um, how did they get in? So again, in my experience, this is, uh, other than the one client who uh, was actually specifically targeted with, with uh, spear phishing emails, this has always been a publicly disclosed vulnerability somewhere in the stack, in Drupal core, like for example, Drupal get in, uh, a contrib module, a library, or sometimes even uh, the, the web server itself, the yeah, SSH server on your, on your, uh, on your web server. So it's, there, someone's just going through publicly listed announcements and, uh, and seeing who hasn't done their upgrades. If you haven't done your upgrades, that means they'll find you. Uh, often you can just find these with Google. If you type in the right magic string into Google, you'll find the vul a vulnerable site. Uh, the security team has recently become, or a few months ago started becoming much more proactive about this and their policies changed. It used to be that uh, most Drupal developers I knew were not aware that the security team only provided support for uh, stable contrib modules. So if it, was, uh, if it was RC15 of something or a dev release uh, or a beta, an alpha, there's no security team support because they, uh, they figure it's not ready and they, they only have so much time. They're volunteers. Uh, now this is very clear and in fact you get a little green shield icon. Um, as you may be aware, recently the process for putting a new module onto Drupal.org changed and 
So instead of a l long, laborious process uh, to become a, uh, someone who's authorized to post new modules on Drupal.org, now anyone can put up a module, uh, but there's a, the, the process has moved to the part where you become someone who's able to request security clearance for your module. Uh, so if you're using a module that doesn't have security clearance, watch out. I mean, sometimes you, you have to do it, but you need to be aware of that. The security team has, um, in the, one of the best uh, disclosure records in the industry, there's a uh, security announcement list. You can get it by email, Twitter, RSS, whatever you want. Um, hook it into your Slack bot. Uh, they will only tell you, though, about things that are in Drupal. If you're using a contrib module, which is using some external library, an example is the single sign-on library uh, CAS, uh, or PHP CAS, so it plugs into the CAS uh, single sign-on system. Uh, the, the, there is no security uh, announcement list for uh, this library, so there was a major vulnerability in that at one point a year or two ago. Uh, and the module maintainers in Drupal, all they can, the best they can do is say, go click this link and go look to see if there's been an advisory recently. So you just have to remember, I've got to click on that link once a month or, or so. Um, uh, yeah, so be aware what modules there are. Things that, that are packaged with Composer in the vendor directory in Drupal 8, there will be security advisories for, there's already been one. Um, so this didn't touch any Drupal code, it was just running Composer to upgrade, uh, in that case, a develop library. Um, uh, but the, the security team isn't going to take the responsibility for every external JavaScript library that you might be using. Um, and of course, some, you or somebody in your organization also needs to make sure that PHP, OpenSSL, your web server, your kernel, and all of those things are up to date. Um, yeah, uh, be aware also that uh, if you're, some old versions of PHP uh, are unsupported by PHP officially. There's no security support for, I think it might be 5.3 now. I can't, I, I can't remember the exact end of life. But uh, yeah, be aware of the end-of-life dates for uh, the version of PHP you're using, especially if you're using, if you still have a Drupal 6 site somewhere, for example, there's no, there's no version of PHP that, will, will, that is supported for that Drupal version that has security support. So again, you've got a problem. Um, okay, so what do they do? Uh, so to, the first step is that you take your site offline because you've got no idea what's going on if, it's, if your server is currently sending out spam, for example. Uh, take a, a, security audit, a security snapshot of your site. Uh, keep a copy of the site, the logs, the database. Um, uh, the first thing that I usually like to do is figure out the timestamp. Figure out when the site was infiltrated uh, because you will need to, to let your users know. Uh, so find that timestamp and then find everything that has been modified since then. Uh, uh, look for PHP scripts that might be doing strange things. Uh, look for things that look like JPEG or, PH, or PDF files, but are actually virus payloads of some sort. Um, uh, look at any nodes or users or comments that have been added since then. That's a common one. Um, look at your server logs. Um, but be aware, depending on how far they got into your site, that many of these things could have been changed by the attacker, including the, uh, the, the timestamp, uh, the M time on uh, files uh, in your file system. So now you've made a copy, and now you need to recover what you can. So how do we do that? Um, you're f so one thing you need to recover is user trust. You do this by uh, announcing that you had a problem. You tell them what was leaked and when. Uh, does your site have credit cards? Were those leaked? Uh, was it just their email uh, addresses and their passwords? Many, many users are going to be using the same password on your site as a whole lot of other sites. Um, this is a bad practice, but people I mean, it's difficult. no one can memorize a thousand passwords, uh, and so people do this unless they're using some sort of fancy password manager. Uh, so you need to let them know to go change their other websites where they might have used the same email uh, address and password. Um, you need to reset accounts, uh, like just uh, re like set the password to some string that, that can't be produced by the hashing function, uh, and tell your users to uh, log in and click the I forgot my password button uh, and reset their passwords. Um, the session table, by clearing the session table will effectively log out anyone who's currently logged in. Uh, so that means that you're t if your attacker had an account and you reset the password, uh, that they can't, uh, they can't still be active on your site. Um, you, may be, you may have PCI or HIPAA or other uh, compliance uh, issues to report. Does anyone have a responsible for a site that's, that needs to respect either of those? I see just, okay, I see a couple hands. If you, if you had a problem, then again, you need to disclose it uh, to, for example, your credit card uh, 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 merchant account. Uh, 
and you need to make sure that there are, uh, you've got passwords and API keys in, uh, in settings.php that might need to be reset or else, I mean, you have to consider them compromised. So that's user trust. The database. Um, hopefully you have hourly or at least nightly snapshots of your database that you can roll back before that timestamp. Remember I said figuring out the timestamp is one of the first things you want to do when you're doing an audit. Um, if you don't have backups, then this is going to be more difficult and you can't promise that you did it completely. Oh, uh, by the way, I should mention all these slides are already online, so uh, feel free to, to take photos or, or notes, but I'll give you the link at the end as well. Um, if you don't have backups, so you should look, you can look for nodes and comments that were created after the date, after the time stamp of the infiltration uh, and look for spam. Uh, you can make sure the PHP filter, hopefully no one here is using the PHP filter. That's okay, I won't make you put up your hands and uh, admit you're guilty if you do, but uh, make sure it's still turned off uh, in Drupal 7. In Drupal 8 is an extra contrib module you have to download so it's, it's easier. Um, you need to look for PHP and JavaScript in the, in the database, uh, uh, things that might be running somewhere. Um, for example, uh, it's, it's a good idea to look for the short tag for uh, the less than question mark, uh, not just less than question mark PHP. If that's in your database, uh, I mean, it, sh it probably shouldn't be in your database. If it is, you should know about it and, and check that code. Uh, you should look for uh, references to script uh, so that someone can look for things where someone's putting in JavaScript that, for example, will watch someone type a password and send it to somebody. Um, there are also many other uh, DOM events like onclick that could be, uh, that could be hooked. Um, so you need to look for those. Uh, and you should also start taking backups if you haven't already been doing that. This, uh, I, just like uh, people often, the way, the way you test your backup strategy is that you have a catastrophic failure. Um, uh, or, and this is an example of a catastrophic <laughs> failure. So after, after something like this, people usually start going through and making sure they've got better backups, so don't forget that step. Or you'll have to do this all again, and it wasn't fun, so you don't want to. That's the, so that's the database. Um, you also have user files you need to recover. Um, so these are uh, JPEGs, PDFs, whatever. Um, again, if you've got nightly backups, then this isn't too hard because you just roll back to the last, last known good state uh, and then manually inspect anything that was added since then. Um, if you don't have backups, then yeah, look at the timestamp to find anything recent. Um, it's also handy, I find, to use the, uh, the Unix utility file, which will just tell you what file type something is, because the .jpg file might not be a .jpg file. Um, look for things in the files directory. Uh, be aware of where your, uh, your web server is able to write. Um, I'll talk more about this later, but ideally your web server was configured so that uh, it can only write to the files directory and not all over your, your uh, PHP source code. Um, so look anywhere where it might be writing. Uh, look for hidden directories. Uh, so anything beginning with a dot, uh, one thing I've seen a couple of attackers do is create a directory called dot, 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 because if you're just typing ls and you're not paying attention and looking for that kind of thing, you might miss that. Uh, I missed it the first time, and uh, one of my colleagues had to point it out. And also, again, like I said, you start taking backups. Uh, there are many reasons to take backups, and this is just one of them. Uh, so that's, so your Drupal site, of course, is three things. It's your, your, it's the uh, user contributed files, uh, it's your database, and it's your code base. So now you need to check your code base. Um, hopefully you're using Git or, or something equivalent. Uh, so then again, you just type git diff and you figure out what's changed, and then it's, it's usually pretty obvious. Again, they're, these are usually script kitties and they're not trying to be subtle. They're, they're just trying to hit as many sites as they can as quickly as they can. Um, so check. Uh, if you don't have backups, then this is more interesting. So I would, uh, what I've done in this case is um, downloaded a whole new copy of Drupal in another directory. Downloaded a whole new copy of every contrib module, the same versions as whatever I'm using. Uh, Reapplied any patches that might have been there and just start from scratch. So copy over the user files after checking them. And other than that, just build your site again if you don't already have some automated tool to do that. Um, the theme, uh, of course, you wrote yourself. And so that you'll need to just check thoroughly every single file in that directory uh, because otherwise you, you've got no idea what's in there. Um, also, the, uh, there's a module called Hacked. It's very useful. The Hacked module will produce a report um, of, it will, 
It will produce a report of any change to core or contrib. So it will, if, you, if you've got a, a project where uh, you think a bunch of like, local uh, modifications have been made to uh, I don't know, the, the views module, it will produce a report and tell you these lines in this file have been changed. Um, however, it, it uh, currently reports files that have been changed and files that have been removed but it does not report any files that have been added. So uh, uh, I find the hacked module is not enough I in this situation. That, uh, that link there where it says it doesn't report new files is a link to the relevant issue in the, in the, in the queue for, for that module. If you've got time to work on that, that could help. Um, uh, yeah, but be aware of the limitation of this, uh, of this tool. So if, again, if you don't have backups, um, I. Uh, something I would find useful would be to check for any feature overrides. Um, this is a little script I use in Drupal 7 uh, in my shell to just, all that will do is make a list. It will print to the screen a list of any feature that has been overrided, has, is in the overridden state, uh, and it will create a file with the feature name dot, uh, uh, dot, dot diff, which will be a list of the changes to that feature. So if there are change features, uh, you should be aware of that. This might be useful just if you think one of your colleagues was being lazy and changing things in the database without committing it to Git too. But uh, um, it will also help uh, in, a, in a security audit uh, in, in Drupal 8. Um, the equivalent would be to look for changes in the configuration uh, between the, what's actually running on the site and what was last uh, exported and saved and uh, presumably uploaded somewhere with Git. And so then, yeah, start using Git or some equivalent tool. Uh, the server. So again, I, I mentioned uh, having a, seeing a, a site that was infiltrated in order to mine bitcoins. So in that case, somebody got root on the server. I have no idea what they were doing. I don't want to, I don't want to be responsible for going through the entire server and figuring out every possible backdoor that they could have put in place. There's a lot of them. Uh, it was a virtual, mach virtual machine, so I just threw it away and rebuilt it or uh, my, my colleague did, rather. Um, if you're using virtualization or containers or something, this is much easier. If not, I mean, you just uh, uh, reinstall the whole server. I, d I did once uh, have uh, a colleague who, li a, uh, uh, an associate in another company that I was talking to who literally had somebody come into their data center and like pull a machine out of the rack and then come back the next week and put it back. So do you think they ever trusted that machine again? Yeah. It was like literally somebody in a black suit wearing like sunglasses. I don't know what three-letter agency they were working for, but uh, yeah, they, they didn't know either, and they, uh, they never turned that machine on again. Yeah, but most of you probably don't have this problem. If you think you're likely to, then you can put in a little spy cam in your data center in the top of the rack uh, like they did. Those were, uh, yeah, some pretty funny pictures. Anyways, um, to go back to more common problems, um, yeah. Uh, the PHP process on your web server, um, where can it write? It only needs to write uh, in the, in, uh, the, the temporary, uh, private, and, um, and public user directories configured in your Drupal site. So don't let it write anywhere else. You can do this uh, using an NFS mount. You can do this using um, Unix um, uh, user own, like uh, uh, making sure that directories are owned by, by root and not by the same process that the web server uh, that, that uh, Apache or uh, PHP FPM is running as. But really, they only, your web server only needs, to, doesn't, should never be able to overwrite index.php. Why would you ever want to do that? So make sure that it's, uh, that it's contained. Um, yeah, and if you're, if you're running a shared hosting environment, which I realize is not very common anymore, it's possible to run PHP uh, as different users. So every user is running in their own, Every process is running as the user associated with one specific client, so they can't go screw up the sites of other clients. So the, that one client site might be attacked and, and in a bad state, but at least the damage is contained. Um, yeah, how could you have avoided this? Uh, well, these are mostly public security update, pub, public uh, security advisories, so you need to apply security updates. Um, you need to have regular backups, like at least a rolling nightly backup um, as a bare minimum that's kept for like a week or two. Um, so that's, uh, that's things in, so that will cover your, have backups of user contributed files and of the database. 
Um, your code base, I'm assuming, is already in Git, as I was saying. Uh, in, you probably have a git ignore file that, that uh, tells git not to commit files with various passwords in them, like a settings.local.php or something else with API keys. So whatever's in your .git ignore file, you need to make sure you can recover in some other way. Uh, however that is, just make sure it's something that you can get back. Um, you could also uh, reduce your PCI compliance exposure by doing something like um, uh, switching to a payment gateway that means that you don't have to take the credit card numbers or and they don't even pass through your site. It's just, for example, an iframe. Um, this will make your life easier and, re and make other people less likely to want to break into your site because they're going to get less data from you. Uh, yeah, use virtual machines or containers when you can so you can tear them down and, uh, and rebuild them uh, when, you, when you run into problems. There are, other, there are many other advantages to, to moving to Docker or something like that, but it, it, it uh, will help you in the case of a security problem as well. Um, yeah, so now we'll list some other resources. I've noticed I'm talking pretty quickly, by the way, so uh, uh, that will, lots of time for questions afterwards if I'm going too fast. Um, the Drupal security team, amazing people, amazing team of volunteers. They have a, they have a helpful uh, page in the documentation site, uh, which this is a link to, called your Drupal site got hacked, now what? So it, it's, this is a very good starting place uh, with lists of other resources. Uh, there's a module called Security Review, which does, uh, looks for basic configuration problems. Um, it's last I checked, it was still just a devel release for Drupal 8, but uh, that's being worked on. Um, so that will look for common configuration problems. There's also a module called Site Audit, which checks for a lot of other things, like performance issues, for example, and it also does a few other very basic uh, security checks. Um, this, there's, a, there's an issue and a, and a patch that's in progress uh, to make the security audit module just go and run the checks in the security review module if you have both enabled, uh, which would be great, uh, although that has yet to land. Uh, and then this can, for example, on the, um, uh, the Pantheon uh, status page, they, they just show you the results of the site audit module. Um, just to make sure you're aware of like basic things you need to fix on your site. So if this patch lands, then there would, that, uh, that coverage would be greater, which would be good. Uh, there's a uh, Drupal Geddon uh, module which looked for, um, which was made to help you secure your site uh, against that particular vulnerability. That was a few years ago. So, I mean, if you haven't fixed that yet, it's probably too late. But uh, um, but that module is still useful since there's a list of resources and a description of a process you can go through to recover a site uh, which you might find applicable um, in other situations. There's also uh, something I, I only discovered about a year ago, um, a very useful uh, PCI compliance white paper that was produced by some members of the Drupal community. Um, so this describes all the, all the ways, all the things you need to do to your Drupal site uh, if you're trying to make it PCI compliant. Um, the main, th main takeaway I got from this is that there are many, many levels of PCI compliance, uh, and the less you touch the user information and the credit card information, the easier it is. So there's, there's, e there's these various levels, and you want to stay at as like, simple a level as possible. So this is a, this is a, a, a very thorough document that will explain what those different levels are uh, and help you figure out how to get your site to um, a, a state where you could say that you're compliant. Uh, the uh, PCI, PCI compliance is funny. It's sort of a kind of like car insurance. No one checks that you've got car insurance until you get into an accident or get pulled over for some other reason. And PCI compliance normally works the same way. They don't come and check uh, until there's been a problem. Uh, and then if they find out after the fact that you that you weren't doing your due diligence, then you then you have issues. Um, there are companies that will go and proactively do an audit of uh, of your site, and they will promise that it's PCI compliant to a given level. Um, these services are expensive uh, because then you can go and sue them if they said it was good and it wasn't. Uh, of course, that costs a lot of money. Um, so yeah, try to, try to reduce your vulnerability as much as possible. Like, I don't know, if your client is okay with having their website, their, their e-commerce be on uh, Shopify or something, you know, it's one less headache for you. Uh, great. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just take questions all at the end, uh, and I'm going to move on now to previous vendor recovery. Has anyone had to do this? Yeah, about a third of you. That's uh, yeah. This is uh, 
This is a lot of fun. Previous, previous vendors. Well, some of them are great. I'm not going to name any of the guilty parties here. Um, not even going to say whether they're at this con. Uh, but uh, yeah, this, is, this, this, uh, this can be interesting. You, start, you see one thing that's a little fishy, and you get that bad feeling, and then you've got to go start looking at everything else. So what do you do when you've got a site, and it's in some unknown state, and you know, you've got no idea who worked on it or who it was outsourced to? Um, here, I've used the hacked module um, to at least get a list of every patch that was applied. Um, you, the patches on your site should be well documented somewhere. There was a, uh, you can do that in, um, for example, if you're using a composer-based process, there's a way to explicitly list every patch. Um, you can have a, just a directory called patches where you throw in a copy of every patch you've got on your site. or some, And then in the get history, you can give your reasons for applying it. Uh, with a link to like the issue uh, up on Drupal.org. If you wrote the patch and no one has ever needed to fix that before, then you should put it on Drupal.org to help other people and so that this will eventually get folded into uh, the next stable release of your module because then you'll never have to patch it again and somebody else will go check your patch and make sure that you wrote it right. Um, yeah, so you, uh, but if you suspect that somebody wasn't already documenting their patches, then uh, you need to make a list of those and so the hacked module can help you with that. Um, yeah, so make a, collect all the patches, document, document them somewhere, whatever uh, works for your organization. Uh, patch files, there's a specific naming system, uh, naming scheme that includes, among other things, uh, the name of the module, a very short, like three or four word description of what the fix is, uh, the, uh, the node ID of the issue on drupal.org, um, the number of the comment, because usually there's like a whole series of, of attempts at a patch before one is accepted, so this will tell you which one it is. So if the, if the patch wasn't named that way, uh, I would just go and rename it so that I can f figure out later like which module it's for or which, where it is in the issue queue. If there's a patch and it looks legitimate, uh, I mean you should always just post it upstream for other people, uh, because uh, if only because this is going to save you work in the future. Then you like you know you go look back and, and realize that you you committed it you you submitted it and somebody else has since committed it and you say thanks me of six months ago you saved me a lot of work today um, so that's contrib and uh, and core uh, of course they've, this person has probably written some custom code at minimum in the theme uh, so then you need to just sit down and read every single one of their modules and figure out what they were trying to do whether that was done in a reasonable way. Um, in my experience, when people, when I'm working with, when I'm doing an audit of a site uh, by uh, a third party, with, built by a third party who is, didn't seem to know what they were doing, usually that takes the form of them, somebody not really knowing the Drupal API and not doing things in the right Drupal way. Uh, like they don't know that there's already an API in core for that or that they could have just downloaded some contrib module instead of like rewriting that functionality in a crappy way. Um, so often I get to just delete modules and uh, like use something from contrib uh, or an API function call. Um, yeah, but you need to read all of their code. Uh, in Drupal 7 uh, features, the .module file, you can, you can put in custom code there. I never do that, but uh, I've, I've realized I have to look there. Um, uh, it didn't occur, didn't al doesn't always occur to me that other people might do that. I don't know if that's a good practice or not. I'm, I'm neutral on that, but uh, other people might be putting it there, so look in those files too. Don't just assume that everything was generated um, uh, by the features module. You should check, to s check for features overrides, of course, uh, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, if this isn't already the case, I would strongly recommend that you uh, organize the modules so that you know which ones are custom, which ones are contrib, um, and which ones are, are features in Drupal 7. Uh, usually I do this with separate directories under modules or sites all modules. Um, yeah, in Drupal 7 there was this weird anti-feature that uh, if you disable the module but you don't uninstall it, the configuration sticks around and sometimes the mo certain hooks in the module might run. Uh, you probably weren't expecting that. Um, so go make a list of those modules that are disabled because somebody just turned them on to try them and then turned them off because they might be having side effects too. So if, it, if you're not using it and you're pretty sure you're never going to use it, just like uninstall it and, and get rid of the module. 
that, so, so that there'll be less code for someone else to read the next time they, they uh, someone else is doing an audit of this site. Um, and uh, an analogous problem in Drupal 8 uh, is that uh, somebody might not know that they need to, to run uh, Composer install to update things that are in the vendor directory managed by Composer and probably not checked into Git, uh, depending on your practices. Uh, so check that those are, are up to date as well. As I, as I mentioned before, there was a, there's a, been, uh, I think, just one so far security advisory for Drupal 8, uh, which in, just involved a version of a, of a library that was in the vendor directory. Uh, so if you hadn't run Composer install, you would have, your site is still, uh, is still vulnerable. Uh, so typical mistakes. Um, often somebody who just doesn't know anything about, a site that was just built by someone who doesn't know Drupal very well, they will, they will just try to rebuild things in the, uh, the theme and template layer. Um, I'm thinking here of Drupal 7 when that was just PHP and so they could write in any logic they want. Uh, they don't know, uh, they, they'll just try to insert code uh, in places where it probably shouldn't have been done. Um, I'll give examples in a minute. But so in particular, look at all the templates for, for uh, logic that shouldn't be in the templates. I mean, you shouldn't be programming in your, in your templates. You should be doing that somewhere else, which is why uh, in Drupal 8, uh, the templates aren't even PHP anymore. All you get is some very simple if statements, which should be enough for you. Um, the PHP module, uh, uh, people love to use this. So you have a node that's just like full of, you go to edit a node and you realize it's full of PHP code doing random things. Um, I mean, yeah, your web browser, that text area in your web browser is the worst possible PHP editor you could ever use. If you make one little syntax error, your site just like is a white screen and you need to go fix that in the database. This is a, a terrible practice, but people do it if they're, if they, uh, because it's a shortcut and it's the fastest way to get something on the page and they're not thinking of maintainability, I guess, because uh, it's my job now. Um, uh, views PHP uh, is a very powerful module that just lets you uh, take a view and and fiddle with it um, before it's displayed to the user. Um, so people often put too much logic there too. There's a, 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 a powerful but overused module called computed field, um, which just lets lets you run uh, PHP code before a given f uh, field is rendered. Um, there are lots of reasons why you might want to do that, but Again, it tends to get overused. Uh, all of your PHP should be somewhere in the file system. It's like, it's crazy to put PHP in the database. It drives me nuts when people do that. You should have it in the database, have it in the file system because then you get to do revisioning in Git. You get to have a Git history. You get to use the opcode cache for performance. You get to have um, useful warnings and errors that actually say the file name and the line number uh, if something goes wrong. Um, none of these things are true if uh, your code is actually right there in the database. There are ways to do this. For example, computed field as, as it gives us an example. Uh, the module maintainers are aware of this. So you can just write um, a function with that magic name and that will run instead uh, uh, and you don't need to type in into a little text area in your web browser the PHP that you want to run. Um, the only as you, can, you can do block visibility. You can control that with, uh, in a custom module. Uh, for example, block hooks in Drupal 7. The only reason I, can, I personally know of in Drupal 7 when you have to put PHP directly into the database is for <coughs> custom panel visibility because there's no way to do that. Um, like if you need to run custom logic, you just have to type in some PHP sometimes. Uh, but in that case, that PHP snippet could should consist of nothing but one function call, and that function should be defined in a custom module somewhere. And then you get to use, use PHPStorm or VI or whatever your editor is, you get to have uh, versioning in Git, uh, and you get to have the opcode cache. Uh, yeah, and then things fall apart, and then you, you, get into the, you get into these classic problems, which I'll give examples of. So these are, these are examples uh, that I have actually seen on sites. So um, custom patches to, to contrib or even to core that were never posted upstream. Uh, but I've, I've, once I found them in a vendor's uh, own GitHub repo and which fortunately was public for some reason. Um, so yeah, take those changes, put them on drupal.org, 
then other, other smart people will look at them and uh, uh, give feedback, maybe roll them into, the, into a future release if they're, if they're useful. Um, uh, I have seen somebody once hack core so that they could have multiple install profiles and then they're inheriting from them. I mean, I guess you might want to do that, except that Drupal core doesn't support this. So they had to write a lot of weird patches to Drupal core to make this possible, and they didn't quite do it right. So it, was, it wasn't a good idea. Uh, but they, it meant that the install profiles, it, the site was loading multiple insto install profiles, each of which was containing their own custom modules. So there was copies of modules in like three different places, and it wasn't clear which one was taking precedence, because each of them had different patches applied to them. That was really messy. Um, uh, there's a module, yeah, UI, UUID features. Has anyone used this module or heard of it? One person? Yeah, UUID features, too. UUID features sounds like a great idea when you first see it. Uh, it was a way in Drupal 7 to put um, the content of a page, for example, your about page, uh, to save that in a feature, because really that's that, that's basically configuration. I mean, you, your content editors aren't changing it, with it much, changing it much. It's perfectly reasonable to want to have that in the file system. The problem is that uh, that breaks various basic assumptions in Drupal 8 core, for example, that there is a UUID uh, for everything. Uh, and so when you install the UUID features modules, it, it comes with a bunch of little patches that you have to apply to core or else it won't work. And so that way, that way lies madness. If you need to stage content, like for example, you want to have a brochure site and um, you want to define the whole thing in code so that you can distribute copies of it without a database, which is a great idea if you've got a simple brochure site. You should be using another method for staging content, uh, such as the deploy module. Uh, you could use the migrate module and just define everything in like a CSV file and, and load that in uh, when, you, uh, when you set up the site. There are other ways to do it, so please don't do that. Um, I've I've seen sites where all of the custom logic was implemented in views PHP or in theme functions, as I mentioned before, or in the templates, because if you're, I mean, if you're looking at a Drupal site and you just know nothing about Drupal and you know I need to change this one thing that's showing up on this one page, the, the template file is the most obvious intuitive way to do that. So people put way too much logic there. Uh, to the extent that I saw a site once where somebody built sort of like a, a lightweight version of views in SQL queries directly in the theme layer. Uh, that makes as little sense as, uh, as, it, as it sounds. And they, while they were at it, this is a multilingual site, so they re-implemented the T function in the theme layer. Yeah, yeah, that, that site was a mess. Um, and that same site, this is something I've seen on other projects, but that same site uh, had uh, references to specific node IDs, user IDs, term IDs, and even um, the title of a, of a page. And so there'd be branching and if statements in the templates based on the title of a page. So my client changed the title and all of a sudden like major functionality in the site stopped working. Uh, this should not be something that happens on your site. Um, you should, it's, it should be very rare that you actually need to hard code a reference to um, a node ID maybe occasionally in a CSS file, but really you're probably doing something wrong or you should probably rethink your approach if, it, if something only works for on lucky node ID seven. Um, yeah, and when you see these problems, whenever I've seen a site with these problems, it means that nobody's updated the contrib modules in years and they've got lots of vulnerabilities too, uh, which then brings you to the intrusion recovery part that I was talking about before. Um, yeah. Uh, Finally, um, I'll mention that uh, for anyone who's not working in-house uh, uh, for, one, for one company but is uh, working for an agency doing sites for other people, um, you have some client expectation management to do. Um, you need to let them know that even though they thought the site was fine last week, it wasn't. Um, uh, a technique I've, I've found is often useful is to bid on uh, doing an audit of the site before you sign something saying that you'll fix it, uh, tell them, just give me a little bit of money and I'll tell you what's wrong with it. And after that, uh, I'll bid on fixing it and other people can bid on fixing it, but it will let you, it will uh, reduce your, uh, your, your exposure. So you're not promising to fix something before you even know how broken it is. Uh, and you can do, offer to do that at a, at a, at a reduced hourly rate um, uh, as an incentive. 
Um, you can, this means that your client is probably, well, they're bad at choosing a vendor, um, uh, before, at least they were before they came to you. Um, they're, bad at, they're probably bad at, at reviewing deliverables, um, and you're probably going to have to spend extra time on the phone with them, uh, so budget for that. Um, sometimes it's a, usually people are more convinced of things they figured out themselves than that someone else told them. That's just basic human nature. So if your client has already figured out that there's a, a problem with their site, then be cautious. Uh, and if you can't convince them that there's a serious problem, then maybe go fix some other site and let someone else take this problem. Uh, yeah, and be better prepared. Um, so ought, take time to audit a new project um, that you're taking on before you promise that you can deliver something by next Tuesday. Um, uh, my company, for example, is happy to do audits, Again, as I mentioned, at a reduced rate, and uh, I think this is a, a, a fine way to, to uh, make sure you're not over-promising. Uh, and uh, you can offer, also offer to send people on training courses, uh, which is something that uh, my company also offers, and as do several other people who are here at, uh, uh, at TripleCon. We've got courses coming up in Washington, Atlanta, and Ottawa, and, uh, and online as well. Um, yeah, so now we have about uh, 15 or so minutes for questions, uh, and as I, as I uh, say here, um, I'm also uh, happy to hear uh, your humorous anecdotes or war stories or cautionary tales or other things you might think might be uh, instructive for this, this group. Uh, if you have a question, please do come to the mic so that uh, it can be recorded, however. Um, these slides you can find uh, at this link here. Uh, also, if you go to the session description on uh, the conference website, there's a link uh, right from there to these slides as well. Uh, so you can share them with your coworkers or go look at the things I click the, the hyperlinks or uh, uh, read the parts I skimmed over quickly. And, uh, or you could also just contact me directly and here's how to get me. Uh, thanks, and I'll start with you. Hi. Uh, I was wondering what Drupal Geddon was. <laughs> okay, um, Drupal Geddon is the uh, uh, yeah Drupal Geddon is the worst security vulnerability I've personally seen in in Drupal uh, since I've since I started using it. It was this exploit that was remotely you could rep you could exploit it remotely. You could do uh, SQL injection remotely. So you basically got to run any process, uh, log in as any user. Um, run any PHP process you want on the server and change anything you want in the database, uh, all without having an account or anything on the site. It was it was pretty bad, and it got uh, it got leaked and there had to be a security advisory early and it was just a great big mess. Yeah, uh, but the security team did all the disclosure they could about that. They uh, no uh, um, yeah no uh, they 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 did their job as best they could under the cir circumstances. So yeah, just watch what they say. Um, that vulnerability, by the way, I'll just mention quickly, was found by uh, an, unnamed, an unnamed client who hired someone, an outside agency, to do a thorough security review of their Drupal site before they launched it. Uh, they, were just, they just thought that someone else should take a, a look at Drupal, and they found something that no one had discovered that had been Drupal, in Drupal for many years. So thanks to those people for doing an audit, and the rest of us uh, benefited from that. Yes? So um, <clears throat> I work in uh, government contracting, which uh, it might as well just be called legacy code. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so uh, as an aspect of that, a lot of what we're dealing with is that uh, the life cycles of these products is anywhere from like three to seven years, which is insane for a web system. Yes. So a lot of times we are like living with code that we know is bad, but ultimately we only have so much budget, we only have so much time. Uh, when you're when you're dealing with that, I mean, largely we do make sure that the critical security updates are there and cross-site scripting isn't possible. But um, <clears throat> at a certain point, I mean, what would you say is the most important things to keep from uh, to fix as you're going along? Because they're not necessarily going to allow you to fix everything in one go. And may like, not is this, possible. Are, you, are you saying that you can't upgrade core or that you can't even upgrade contrib? I mentioned more referring to um, like you want to hear a project and they'll have a custom module, but it has like has features that you can't afford to rebuild. Okay. So like, how do you prioritize which ones you're going to fix first? Uh, uh, <laughs> um, 
That's a that's a that's a hard question. Um, yeah, I realize. I just was, yeah. I was curious because. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I, I haven't. Yeah, if I had to do that. Um, I mean, I guess I would start with the things I think are most likely to make the site blow up. So, for example, security issues, like blatant security issues. Um, I mean, there, there, are, there are people, there's, there's a couple, there are three, I think, agencies that are still offering long-term support for Drupal 6 if, if like, your site is that old. Um, they don't have many clients left anymore, but there's a few. Um, there are security agencies that put in place um, a proxy, kind of like how you can have a CDN like Cloudflare. Like they'll put in a layer that checks for basic SQL injection and things like that. Um, so maybe a service like that would help you if you know you just can't upgrade anything. Um, making sure you know who the people are who have accounts on the site and that it's a small number and that you trust them and it's not someone who left uh, angry last year. I, would, I guess I would start with things like that. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, I'm, yeah. We largely we find that even in the government space, like. The security aspects is not the problem. It's more just, it, as I've been calling it, time capsule code, which is yeah. you can look at it and see, oh, well, this is how we wrote PHP five years ago. Right, um, right, 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 and we right. can't really fix it. But we can make sure that at least it's not horrible as far as someone yeah. can destroy our site. But, I mean, at a certain point, what what is an acceptable level of <laughs> bad, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. I, that, sound, that sounds like a decision for whoever writes the checks. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess all, the best you can do would be to present uh, an audit and say these things, here's the things I think are important. These ones will take a week to fix. This one would take three months to fix. Uh, if you don't fix them, then these things will happen. And then at least you can say I told you so later. Yeah. 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 Well, but, thank you. Sorry, yeah, you, my no, question no, no. was a little circuitous, yeah. but I wanted to bring it out there. Yeah. If you don't have the budget, then I mean, there's, there's only, only so, much so much you can do. Yeah. And nothing's going to change that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for a thorough review of security hardening Drupal. Um, I want to encourage everyone in the audience to uh, subscribe to the security list that Drupal has. Yes. Uh, they do a great job. Uh, they really we, do. So I'm in higher ed, and uh, we WordPress doesn't offer anything quite as copper. You have to go to a third-party vendor to get something yeah. similar. Yeah, the WordPress people will only tell you about, like, the, like the core of WordPress. Support. There's nothing equivalent for like all the contrib modules or uh, sorry plugins. I can't even remember what right. they call them. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's a whole different yeah uh, bailey, bailey work. Yeah. The other thing um, is when we're talking like Drupal again, what was interesting was the user table. Yeah. So so it's it may sound tedious to a site builder, but you want to spend a little time, and if you find non-contiguous IDs littering yeah. your user table, that's a good indicator. Yes. Of an infection. One one last thing I would I would add to your presentation is to try to offload any um, services, for example, web form might be better served. We use Qualtrics. Right. And uh, the, you can reduce your vector for attack by mm -hmm. offloading. You, you can do all this stuff with PHP. You can make Drupal home base for all these things, but uh, get it back to just serving pages and try to offload to third parties. Yeah. As such, and also authentication. We, we use Shibboleth. Right. And everything has to go through the user table, so. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so some of us work, you know, internally for a company that, mm -hmm. you know, you're basically the marketing website or whatever. Um, so you'll get ideas that come across, and it's, you know, well, we're actually going to A-B test this. And, you know, you can pretty much tell from the get-go it's nothing that's ever going to be long lasting or ever be reproduced ever again other than this one instance because it's generally a bad idea to start with but somebody got it in their head so you're doing it um, so there's oftentimes things where you know okay I could insert some PHP into a theme file or, or you know if you're on d7 or I could I could you know do some direct PHP injection into the database and through a, a you know content um, and accomplish this in 20 minutes to a half hour, I could build a custom module to do this one thing. It's going to take me a week, and yeah. then it's going to go away. How do you balance uh, when to do the, the right way versus when to do it the 20 minutes way yeah. so that it can just be done and then go away again? So you, 
So, right. So you want to do just a quick prototype and just show it to your boss, and then so they realize it's and a then dumb you, idea. you know you throw it on like a, a you throw it up publicly for a short amount of time, and then they go, yeah, that that didn't do what we were expecting. Yeah. They make it go away. And then they and then the pro, but if they like the prototype, then they expect you to just maintain that for the next five years and reproduce it thirty-seven times. Right in 20, yeah. mi 20 minutes each time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Oh, and if somebody else comes yeah. in and looks at you, they go, well, you're, you did this wrong, who's, and you did this the, wrong, and you look like the, you the look bad like past network. vendor, and you're like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I guess you have to hope your, whoever your manager is understands the difference between a prototype and something that, that's maintainable. Yeah, mm -hmm. so try to explain, explain that clearly. But uh, yeah, I mean, if they, if, they want, if they want to give you 20 minutes, then, then it's, you're only going to be able to support it so well. Hey, do you want to just come to the mic so everyone, so, uh, everyone can hear you? If you're reporting to 44 different people, then you you might have some other problems. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what's the timeline it takes you to all that site. Um, yeah, um, let's see. I mean, if, if I start looking and every, if I can see right away that there's nothing weird, uh, I mean, yeah, like, I've, I've done it in as little as a day, uh, if, if the site was very well built and I could, I could see that there's nothing strange. Um, another time it took me, like, three weeks uh, because the site like made no sense and so I had to go read everything very carefully and figure out what on earth they were trying to do. Uh, so it depends how broken it is, I guess. That's the short answer. But I mean, the time it took me three weeks, like after one day I could already tell it would take me three, a day, after a day I knew that it was going to take me three weeks, right? So um, yeah, I'd say like in half a day to a day, well in, in a day I could probably have a general sense of at least how long the audit would take. If, if core has been hacked? Uh, well, I mean, as soon as, I, as soon as you see that there's been an infiltration, then you stop and you deal with the infiltration. Uh, like when I said, when it was mentioned three weeks, like that was in a case where there was like a, a previous vendor who had just made a total mess of the thing and it needed to go read everything they did. But if there was, yeah, if I, if I see that someone had made some change to core that was like, it, that was done by an attacker, and you immediately stop and you roll back to the last known good version and start mitigating. Oh, 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 like, so, like weird patches, like not an attacker. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if everything else on the site looked, in one day, I, that would be enough time for me to say that everything else on the site made sense except there's this one weird patch in core. And if it's like a, a short patch, then like it doesn't take you long to figure out what it's doing and hopefully do it in a better way or or if it's a great patch and they just never published it to publish it um, yeah so yeah dep it depends how much code there is and how much it's been changed I guess yeah yeah anything else yeah uh, do you have objective tools that you provide for like performance in your audits uh, is it just typically like hey test my site with Google and you know you get a number or is, yeah. or do you have some sort of standardized reporting to say um, your site is bad or your site is good from a performance perspective? Yeah, um, yeah. Performance audit. That's a that's a whole other thing. I wasn't uh, I wasn't uh, talking about that at all here. Um, there are tools that will do performance audits. Um, uh, for example, there's a company which I think has got a booth here called uh, Blackfire that that does performance audits and will tell you, you know this this code like. Uh, these lines in this file are being run many, many times. Maybe you should go look at that. Uh, but um, yeah, there's a variety of tools and vendors who will who, to help with with that. Um,
But uh, yeah, that, that wasn't uh, the kind of audit I was, I was, uh, I was talking about in this talk. Okay. Uh, any other questions? No, great. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, I mean, it would be an hourly rate. 